Hello, and welcome everyone to this session of uh, Open Education Champions. Open Education Champions is a chance to talk to important open education advocates and actors, uh, which is why we are talking to you as an Open Education Champion today. Uh, the intent is for students, teachers, pedagogues, and practitioners of open education, like yourself, to discuss the importance of open education and to share experiences with uh, facilitating the creation of more OER to inspire others to do the same, underline the role of librarians uh, in this process when it's worth it. Uh, my name is uh, Paola Corti. I am the Open Education Community Manager at uh, Spark Europe, and I am very pleased to welcome Christina Ranzi from uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. Welcome, Chrissy, and thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you so much for this invitation, Paola. How could I say no? <laughs> <laughs> so, can you tell? Uh, can you tell us a bit uh, about your work with the OER and on open pedagogy uh, more broadly? How did you come to, to be involved in open education? And uh, have librarians uh, supported you on that open education journey? Thank you for this question. I think this question helped me reflect uh, on my journey as an open practitioner and researcher. And I came to the conclusion that um, it happened naturally. Uh, it wasn't something that I planned to do, but uh, being born in one country, in, in Germany, then um, being Greek born in Germany, then moving from Germany to Greece, and then later from Greece to the UK, I have always been an outsider, a foreigner, and I have found that through sharing, um, we can connect with other people. And I think that sharing, uh, the values of, of sharing have been fundamental in my uh, approach to connect with people and ideas. And uh, they're also very deeply uh, ingrained in what open education is about. It is that sharing that helps us not just grow as individuals, but also as as a, as a collective, as a society. And uh, I came to this, yeah, not quite naturally. I didn't make any effort <laughs> because I value collaboration. I know that, um, well, I often say, you know, an idea that is not shared uh, dies. So sharing, again, uh, ideas and connecting with people is, is fundamental to what I do. And I um, do that uh, throughout my personal life, but also my professional life. Regarding librarians, um, I had the pleasure to meet a fantastic librarian. They do such amazing uh, work. Um, this lady is called Margie Macmillan, and I'm sure she doesn't mind me <laughs> mentioning her name, but she's from Canada. And I came uh, across her quite um, well. It, it, again, it wasn't planned, but I reached out for help. Uh, on uh, on Twitter and um, Margie responded. So uh, she has been of great help uh, when I did my doctoral studies in open education. And since then we have become close collaborators actually and friends and have many critical um, conversations among us. And there are real treasures, uh, librarians, I have to say. And I think they are perhaps underused um, by educators. So there is a big potential there and, and maybe you know, uh, enabling uh, academics to work more closely with the librarian uh, would be really, really valuable. Well, thank you for that. And I completely agree. Not being a librarian myself, but uh, more like an instructional designer, I completely agree that they are needed and uh, many of the skills they have are crucial to enhance the open education agenda. So who has benefited from open education at your institution now, as well as beyond uh, your institution? And what would you say have been the key benefits? I think the key, I'll start with this one. The key benefit for, for me personally is that you open teaching, you make it more transparent, you make it democratic, you made it make it embracing. Um, because often, and uh, you can see in the literature, you know, teaching is, something that you often do on your own in a classroom where you close the door um, you know in the dark maybe where nobody can see what you do just your students so I think open education brings 
uh, refreshment. It's refreshing and it, it brings that openness and transparency to the process of, of teaching and learning and helps colleagues get out of uh, their little silos, their little box and discuss and share and collaborate and co-create with other educators and students from across the globe. I think that is one of the biggest benefits that we break free from our little boxes as individual educators and learn the value of, again, I'm repeating myself, but this is fundamental, of sharing, of sharing and connecting and learning with and from each other and open education creates that fantastic platform within my institution i have um, uh, as an academic developer i support colleagues who are also academics or in professional services and support student learning in, in different ways and i have embedded open practices and i model such practices in in my everyday job but also through additional projects that i'm involved in so i could maybe I'll present two examples. Uh, I support our faculty, uh, Arts and Humanities faculty, and um, within that faculty there is a colleague, um, Dr. Carmen Herrero, she teaches Spanish, and she was inspired by my work apparently, uh, and did that without me even knowing <laughs> that she was looking at my work and uh, transformed her practices. She, I introduced her in an indirect way, I, I guess, through my work uh, into open education. And she then uh, started implementing uh, very specific changes in her curriculum and the assessment strategies, and is now using um, and co-creating OER with her own students. And that is fantastic, but she hasn't just done that. She has shared that uh, beyond the institution. And she was actually in Milan uh, at the OE Global as well in 2019, Paula, was it? <laughs> 2019, <laughs> exactly. Before the pandemic. Exactly. Um, so this is something that happened without me knowing, somebody accessing my work because I make it openly available. Another big, big bonus. It's not hidden behind a, a firewall. Um, another example is where I directly invited, if you like, uh, two colleagues from the same faculty um, Louise Bachelor and Ben Greenhall to work during the pandemic on the project with the students. And that was co-creating uh, a picture book, Paula, you will be happy to know, another <laughs> picture book. Definitely, it, yes. Yeah, and it was about COVID, you know, we, we, we called it in the end, I can't remember now, what was it called? Yes, the Invisible King. Uh, and uh, it was the first time the, the students worked on a collaborative project like this, the first time um, they worked on an open education project and the first time we actually made something available under Creative Commons license as a collective that we shared um, to raise money for the um, Manchester mayor's um, fund. He has a, a pot of money where he helps those in need. So. I think we didn't just share, but we also wanted to raise uh, money for good. And that's, again, something uh, very deeply a part of, of the mission of open education, to share, to enable others, but also to, um, uh, to, to, to grow, to grow as a collective and, and support that social mission. You know, universities have a, a social mission. Yeah. Um, and we, we are creating knowledge and disseminating knowledge, but beyond that, it is also about connecting with uh, local communities and global communities um, to do good for society and, and, and create opportunities for learning wherever people are so that we can, we can all flourish. Yeah, the, the so-called third mission of universities is completely consistent with all the values of open education. I think so, but uh, often it's not mentioned, you know, it's not mentioned anywhere. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, if it has been normalized, it wouldn't be a bad thing. I think at the moment, open education is still in the periphery and is practiced by innovators, by open practitioners, uh, often at the sideline of, uh, of activities that are happening in, uh, in the higher education institution. That's what my experience has shown. And often yeah. um, those open practitioners find allies in other institutions, often easier to find allies in other institutions. I think that's something, again, that 
it would be useful to look at what the barriers are perhaps to engage more colleagues at the local level so they can uh, also benefit. Obviously, academic developers do that, but I think we also need support uh, from strategic leaders in institution, from librarians and other colleagues across, I think. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And what do you see as a key successes in, open, in the open education movement so far, starting from your own experience? I think bringing people and ideas together, I would say. I think that has been the big bonus, to bring diverse perspectives together, um, to not just be more tolerant about each other, but recognize, I think, and that is important, that diverse perspectives, even if we don't like them or disagree with them, you know, are extremely valuable and help us learn uh, and move forward, I think, in a more inclusive and, and richer way, I think. So I think that has been the bonus that through open education and open education as a concept, by the way, is nothing new. I mean, what we are doing now is that, uh, you know, we have all the network technologies and we can do that at scale, I think, but uh, humans from the moment you know, of their first existence started sharing. Yes. Um, we are social animals, like Aristotle said, you know, and we also always want the company uh, of others. So it's no different, I think, in open education, but we can do it at scale now. We can do it at global level. Um, and I think that is a big bonus that we have managed often with limited resources also, or no resources at all, um, based on our pure commitment to share and connect and learn and, and expand our, our personal and collective horizons, I think with others, to, uh, to collaborate with others and not just solve problems, but enrich our personal and collective lives, I think. Um, so what I have done personally as an academic developer, I have set up with many, many other colleagues. Again, I'm not doing anything on my own, not because I can't, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure I couldn't do all this on my own anyway, but it's much more nicer and democratic to work with others for, for the reason I already said, you know, bringing these diverse um, views and perspectives in. Um, but I've set up with many other colleagues, like I said, uh, a series of networks, communities, open courses in the area of professional mm -hmm. development for academics in their learning um, and teaching. And I've been doing that for uh, a number of years. Many of these activities and initiatives have been sustained for years without any penny uh, being spent, you know, without any funding, purely driven by uh, the people who get involved. But I think there's something that needs to be said here. Why do people get involved, you know, without having any, any financial gains, if you like, or or any other gains. I think it's that collegiality that we get, and I personally also get to feel connected um, with other people, but also knowing that together we can achieve something bigger, something that none of us on our own uh, could achieve. And you, Paula, have been part of such a project <laughs> very <laughs> recently, you know, where we worked on the picture book project. Yes. And we both know how challenging that was. But I think oh, yes. what got us through was that camaraderie was that open dialogue and debate and honesty with each other, I think. And because we were committed to the project itself and all wanted it to succeed, we all contributed in the way that we could. And we were tolerant of maybe not being available all the time or you know, not being able to do certain things. And you told me, Paula, that you wanted to illustrate and you told it to me too late. <laughs> you're right <laughs> yes so yes so networks and communities and um, and open education resources and um yeah it, it has been a pleasure to get to know so many people in different uh, places if you want me to mention any specific examples you go ahead if you have an example that you want to share uh, feel free to do that Okay, well, I, I can mention maybe an example to show how ideas travel uh, and why the seed for that initiative might have been uh, in myself, you know, in my own practice from a master's I completed in blended and online uh, education at Edinburgh Napier University in 2011, I think I completed this. 
uh, a colleague from Sweden found me and together we developed uh, an open course flexible distance and online learning, which then um, was offered for two years as a cross institutional open collaborative course for academics and other professionals who teach or support learning in both our um, institutions, but also openly to, to anybody from across the world. And that course is still offered under the umbrella of uh, open networked uh, learning today with uh, colleagues in Sweden and other universities uh, involved. And I then set up uh, a different course, a, a different um, course, yes, called for, uh, for us. Uh, flexible, open and, and social learning. So that shows that ideas can travel if we openly license them properly and acknowledge uh, where ideas come from. I think um, it, it's a useful way forward, yes, to, to spread practices and engage more colleagues in academic development, in, in their own professional development to enhance their, their teaching. And uh, in the UK, and it's not the same across the globe as far as I know, we are quite ahead because we have uh, teaching qualifications for academics yes. in their teaching and that's not happening elsewhere but what we uh, have seen and the research confirms that often after completing the teaching qualifications that we have at po often at postgraduate level a, a pg cert in academic practice or learning and teaching in higher education often academics afterwards disappear from our radars and what I have seen is that these colleagues um, reach out to become members of networks and communities, either uh, in their uh, discipline or in cross-disciplinary uh, communities and networks. And the work, some of the work that I have done in this area has captured um, their interest and uh, they engage regularly. For example, the LTHE chat is such an example. Yes. That runs as, a, as an open initiative completely led um, by a rotating organizing team. And if you ask um, somebody, they will probably not even know that it was an idea that I first of all um, started, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't need uh, this kind of uh, recognition, but somehow you, you, you've you been seeding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if we can create other leaders and empower others through authentic engagement, you know, in it, uh, and it doesn't feel like this is my initiative, I am leading this, and you feel a very, <laughs> a limited sense of ownership you yeah. know that goes back to one individual i think nothing can grow i think nothing can grow if you just learn to let go it will travel and it will go further and people will engage because there is also something in there for them thank you thank you chrissy and what still needs to be done for open education to truly take all the what what are still uh, the most pressing challenges that you see? Well, from my perspective, I can only speak as a, as a practitioner, I think, and a researcher of, uh, in, the, in the area of open education. I, I, would, I see often that conversations on open education focus more on higher education. And I think the picture book we did, Paula, together, uh, was trying to break free of that. Yeah. I think there is a need and an opportunity now more than ever before, I think, to bridge um, these that gap between um, the school sector, if you like, and further education and higher education. Why do we see these boxes as separate boxes? You know, can we can we integrate our our, our work um, more of open education across the education sector? Um, I think if we if students arrive in higher education and it's for them the first time they find out, ah, this is what higher education, sometimes, you know, ah, this is what higher education is, I think it's a bit late and they will have missed so many learning opportunities and we talk a lot about lifelong learning and life-wide learning and some of these things they have been utilized because the generation who's going now to university, they have been born, you know, with uh, iPads in their pockets, if you like, and they have used certain um, tools and, and courses and resources online, but they have no clue often that what open education resources are, how they can uh, be part of this and um, the real uh, value 
for them uh, as individuals. So I think integrating um, and, and talking more holistically about open education across the, uh, the education sector would be useful. A another point I think is important is to normalize practices, not maybe, I mean, in the past, and I have done it myself, you know, you could have, for example, a, a module called open education. You can have another one on creativity or whatever, but is there really a need for that? Would it not be more valuable to integrate what open education stands for in whatever you teach to, like I said earlier, to model and use uh, and uh, enable uh, students and colleagues to discover the real values and the potential uh, of open education um, for themselves, but also as a social mission. You know, if we go back to the sustainable development goals, um, it is often forgotten. Open education, until recently, was not regarded as, as being part of this. And um, the UNESCO recommendations, obviously, in 2019 made a huge difference, I think, for that, for being more explicit uh, of the role open education can play. And universities are now very much concerned about sustainability. And often more about environmental sustainability. But the point I want to make is that, yes, about the environment, but without education, we can't do anything. So education uh -huh. is really fundamental and open education and lifelong um, learning, if you like, and Professor Norman Jackson has done a lot of work in that area, um, can really contribute positively. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Chrissy, also for your enthusiasm in conveying those messages. So what are your plans for the future of open education now? Well, like I said earlier with the school sector, I think it, I would love to work more closely with, with schools to spread the message uh, of open education to, um, to teachers there and, and students and perhaps work on, on collaborative projects with schools. So we have a higher education and the school sector actually working together on projects, students and staff um, from both sectors. I think that's, that's one thing that I would love um, to, to start doing much, much more, I think. And uh, it, would, it would be very useful for for everybody involved, I think, to learn more about open education, how that can be used, you know, also for assessment purposes. <clears throat> yeah. We talk a lot about uh, authentic assessment, but uh, open education is forgotten. You know, what role can open education play? And actually creating and co-creating uh, open education resources um, is, is a valuable tool, if you like, for for creating authentic assessments and learning through making. You know, it's a, it's a making, you are making something. And we all know that we learn a lot more through making than, than listening to people. Definitely. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's one thing. I'll continue, I guess, modeling uh, practices, uh, learning, reading about, you know, the latest developments because there are now loads more open educators, I think, and um, practitioners and researchers across the globe. Uh, and I think one other thing that I would like to do more is be more uh, aware and, and familiar with the work of uh, the work of our colleagues are doing in the in the global south. Um, I have always been trying to be uh, balanced, I think, in, you know, the, the, not balanced, maybe, but like I said, diverse to have bring diverse people together and, and viewpoints. But I think in the literature still, um, what is dominant is voices from the global north. Yes. And I think that's something where librarians potentially also could help <laughs> quite a lot, I think. I completely agree on this. And I'm also thinking back to open at the margins as a, a very high opening uh, publication around the, the value of uh, having a diverse uh, set of voices around every topic that we touch. <laughs> yes, and then it's a dominance, obviously, of English as well, isn't it? And while it's a lingua franca, it can also be yeah. a barrier and uh, quite dominant, I think, in 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 viewpoints as well. So it would be refreshing to to learn more about different pedagogical models, frameworks, and approaches that are used in in different parts of the world. You know, and bring that cultural richness uh, into this as well, instead of, you know, Western 
um, voice is dominating. Definitely, that is something that is uh, under our radar in the annual as a uh, both a challenge because of course translating every tool in different languages is uh, take, it takes time and it takes uh, skills. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are so rich thanks to our diverse histories and languages, and uh, it would be a pity to lose that along the way. So in a way, Europe can be, uh, let's say, um, uh, an experimentation uh, setting. And then what works uh, can be reused uh, with other languages, including Global South, uh, Extreme East, Extreme West, etc. It would be great to do that. Exactly. And there is, I think I, I need to mention this, there's an important project, yes. um, the Open Education for a Better World that has been around for well, four years, the fourth yes. round has just uh, completed and I've been a mentor from, from the beginning. And that, that's an UNESCO supported project uh, led by Nova Gorica University in Slovenia. And you might think that's a small institution, but it's a small institution with a big vision. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with a big vision and a big commitment. And each year, you know, it has a call, it is a mentoring program. And I think Paula, you are a mentor as well. Yes, uh, on that program oh, yeah. for some years now. So, you know, we know that how invigorating that is to uh, to connect and and learn about all the plans and projects. You know, from colleagues across the world. I've supported colleagues in um, um, in India this year. In India, a little girl who created a, a course with her mom. You know, this was from the youth hub that was introduced uh, this uh -huh. year for the very first time. And it was fascinating, the commitment to, uh, the course was around art uh, and well-being. Something that has also become very, very important, especially during the pandemic. Yes. Um, and, and it's good to see, you know, the, the young people uh, being committed and wanting to do something to help um, humans wherever they are. So that was just wonderful. But there are so many fantastic ideas and the whole program is aligned to um, the SDGs, obviously, as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Chrissy, for the, the context that you gave to your answers to with a lot of examples. Is there anything that you would like to add uh, to this amazing uh, uh, contribution that you are providing us? And thanks again for that around the open education scenario. Is there anything else you would like to add now or? Well, I hope some of these uh, responses, reflections, <laughs> are useful for, for other people and... Um, they will be. <laughs> I, I hope they are, because I think it's something that um, is deeply rooted in the nature of, of human being to be open and, and sharing. And I think we need to revisit our caring natures uh, and being kind to each other, because I think that's the only way we can save ourselves, but also our planet. Um, this week, there is a big... Uh, conference in in Glasgow, the COP twenty six, yes. and uh, talking about climate change, um, you know, as a, as a as a central theme. But it is about collaboration. It is about sharing. It is about all these things we say about open education. So there is hope. There must be hope. <laughs> yes, yes, I completely agree with that. And uh, hope is built on uh, the the everyday work that uh, all people are doing in open education everywhere. So uh, yes. it's really practical and it's not just an ideal. <laughs> it's not exactly, it's hands-on. It's not just something talking about, but it's actually doing. And I think the doing is what matters because we can say anything, but if we it's not followed up uh, by, by, by making things happen, um, it's pointless. So yes, yeah. I think open education uh, practitioners are doers, are makers are people who change, you know, can change the world if we all connect. I have a question, Paula, if that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, one question I have is about uh, librarians. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you think librarians could help, you know, colleagues in the universities or across the education sector more than they are doing? Or do you have any a specific example where this has been done uh, somewhere effectively? 
Yeah, well, uh, academic librarians around Europe are already doing an amazing job uh, in order to support uh, the open education development. And uh, they are giving their, uh, some of them are doing uh, really great in uh, contributing to make open education the default. Uh, the, the contexts are very different around Europe because uh, well, we have, as we just said, we have different languages, we have different histories, and we also have different uh, legal systems, but also uh, still educational systems are not all consistent with each other. So things are really progressing in different ways. So we have great examples coming from the Netherlands, for example, where uh, national policies are very uh, close to open education and the institutions can count on them to be available so also academic librarians can contribute more openly uh, to that and uh, they are actually being involved uh, um, more often in uh, decision making around open education so for example we have members who are contributing now to define the agenda around uh, implementing repositories in their own institution, which is which it doesn't which doesn't happen so often with librarians. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that things are changing, and also in no way progress are made on a daily basis. Some other countries where no uh, national policy is available and no plan uh, explicitly addresses open education, well they still have to work uh, at their institution basis. And sometimes it's difficult to find a time window and uh, the space and the energies to contribute during the everyday life. But they are doing this anyway, as you said, on a personal, uh, as a personal decision, as a personal uh, contribution, because they believe that their skills can contribute and they are doing uh, um, a great job on that. So we still need to progress in uh, at different levels. Uh, continue to do groundwork at the institutional level, but also uh, pushing to have policies at the national level that can mm -hmm. help us embrace open education at large. Because we have this tool that you quoted before, which is the UNESCO year recommendation. And actually, it is very practical if we look at it uh, with uh, uh, our eyes open. So we really need to, to follow the lead of UNESCO and uh, start implementing it, using uh, uh, all the skills that uh, are available out there. <laughs> and librarians really can have a key role. Yes, we can all do a little bit, isn't it? If we all yes. do a little bit, we can achieve so much. I often contact our... Um, librarian we have an academic librarian attached to our program and you know when when a new um open textbook is published etc that's relevant to our program i'm always seeking their support to be added yeah. to uh, to our database so that colleagues can find it and uh, that's quite nice you know that these are included but it would be useful also to see at strategic level you know yes. how uh, open education can become far, part of the fabric uh, of learning more instead of being an afterthought yes. or an add-on, I think. Yeah, we, we, we should work really to make it the default choice, <laughs> yes. as it happens with many other uh, choices that are made on a daily basis. Well, Tracy, thank you very much for this conversation. It's been really uh, interesting and uh, it's going to enrich our uh, context. And uh, I really look forward to share this with uh, the open education community as soon as uh, we are ready. So thanks again, really. <laughs> thank you so much, Paula. Thank you.